Hello, I'm Peter Murray. I trained as an architect, but I've never practiced as one. And I wanted to talk a bit today about what a good training architecture is for a whole series of related professions. I became interested in architecture at a fairly young age. My father was passionate about it. He wasn't an architect, but he particularly liked Paris churches. So every family outing we went on, we normally visited one or two Paris churches of interest. And this is St. Syriac's Church in Laycock in Wiltshire, which is the National Trust village in which I was brought up. And here is Laycock Abbey with its 18th century Sanderson Miller Strawberry Hill frontage, but also the interior had these wonderful 13th century cloisters and of course the medieval village. All these things went together to build my passion for architecture. And when it came to deciding on a career, I couldn't quite make up my mind as to whether I wanted to go to university to study English because I enjoyed writing or whether I was going to train as an architect. What made up my mind was a Christmas lecture given by an architect called Tom Burrow, who taught at the Royal West of England Academy School of Architecture in Bristol. His lecture so inspired me that I decided to go to the RWA, as it was called then. When I was at Bristol, of course, I did my normal schoolwork, but also I became very interested in publishing and I published this student magazine called Megascope, which I distributed through the British Architectural Students Association, of which I was on the committee at the time. And also I got very involved with a group of students who did all sorts of interesting things to raise the profile of architecture in the university. And uh, this was where we voted the Robinson Building, a new tall building in Bristol, as the ugliest building. This was a vote we held amongst the students in the university and was a part of a campaign, an anti-ugly campaign, which was being led at the time by the Central Polytechnic in London. One of the important influences on me at the time was when Cedric Price came down to Bristol and gave a lecture and I was very excited by what he was saying and particularly about his plans for the Fun Palace designed for the theatre producer Joan Littlewood in Stratford in East London. This flexible changing building was something that then went on to influence the Pompidou Centre in Paris. And this whole idea of high-tech architecture, but flexible, changeable architecture really excited me. And another influence, of course, was the Archigram group, not just because of their publishing and their fantastic Archigram magazine, but also, again, the idea of a new form of architecture related to change, related to new technology. And Peter Cook came and gave a lecture in Bristol. And I was very excited by that. And from that lecture onwards, I wanted to move from Bristol to go to the Architectural Association in Bedford Square. But before I did that, Buckminster Fuller came to Bristol for a month of lecturing and uh, mentoring and coaching. And that again had a huge influence on my interests in architecture at the time. Buckminster Fuller would lecture sometimes four hours of lecturing, uh, but it was really exciting stuff. And one of the key things that he was preaching at the time was about the world design science decade and how he saw architects as potential, I'd say, saviors of planet Earth, because it was all about harnessing resources, about sustainability, about spaceship Earth. And he was looking to architects for students really to work on that program. And that was what I did my thesis on when I got to the Architectural Association. But at the same time at the AA, I started up another magazine, this time with a friend, Jeffrey Smythe. And this was called Clip Kit because it actually was a kit, a series of articles which came at different times and you clipped it all together with a plastic clips, which were quite novel at the time. My tutor then in fifth year was Peter Cook. My thesis, as I said, was on the world science design decade. My final year project was on inflatables. And this was an article about the inflatable I designed for my fifth year, which was 
published in Nova magazine, a rather trendy uh, women's magazine at the time. And while I was still in my fifth year at the AA, I was the design editor of this magazine. When I finished uh, at the AA, I became technical editor of AD. And AD had been a longtime champion of Buckminster Fuller. And at the time, in the early 70s, this was when we were going through the three-day week, the oil crisis, and there was a big focus on sustainability, on energy conservation, and issues that we rather forgot about uh, once we discovered North Sea oil. And, and many architects only started thinking about again uh, a decade or so ago. After architectural design, I moved to uh, building design in the late 70s. This was not a great period for architecture. There was not a lot of really high quality work going on. And in fact, uh, not a lot of work at all. There was a recession following on from the early 70s oil crisis and the Labour government was in a certain amount of chaos and also the building industry was suffering from a lot of problems such as we see here of failures in post-war housing. A lesson for us all at the moment. I was editor of the RABA journal but also managing director of RABA magazines uh, which meant that uh, my job basically was to make the loss-making journal into a profitable enterprise. And while it was a really interesting project editorially to deliver, it was also a good time for me to actually learn how to run a business and how to run a magazine. And these were really quite trying times because of the recession that was happening in the late 70s. Inflation was going up to about 25% at times, and interest rates were around 15%. You had to redo your budgets every few weeks just to keep pace with the uh, changing economy. So that was a very sound lesson, which I found very useful when I started Blueprint uh, in 1983. I invited Dan Sujic to be the editor and Simon Esterson as the art editor. And we started producing that initially in our spare time, mainly at weekends. And after running it for just over a year, it was successful enough for us to start running as a full-time operation. And while I was at Blueprint, Dan and I were invited to curate the exhibition New Architecture, the work of Foster Rogers Sterling. And so working with these people like Richard Rogers, Jim Sterling, and Norman Foster was a really fascinating experience, both in terms of what we were showing about their architecture, but also working close with them, understanding how they worked, their interests, and uh, what drove them was a really fascinating experience. And 10 years later, I curated another exhibition on architecture for the Royal Academy, which was Living Bridges, the inhabited bridge, past, present and future, where with Nigel Coates designing the installation, uh, we put in a real river running through the galleries of the Royal Academy uh, with fantastic models of these inhabited bridges from Old London Bridge through to a new idea for a garden bridge across the Thames from Temple to the South Bank, an idea which was then emulated a few years later by Thomas Heatherwick with his uh, garden bridge as well, which sadly did not happen. Then while we were publishing Blueprint, Stuart Lipton and Peter Palumbo, quite separately, but about the same time, got in touch saying, uh, we like what Blueprint is doing, but could you help us with our communications for our developments? Because what we need is somebody who can produce elegant brochures and elegant information which people can understand about our uh, projects. Stuart at the time was building Broadgate. Peter Palumbo had just lost the public inquiry for the uh, Mansion House development by Mies van der Rohe, you see in the photograph, and uh, he was just starting off with James Sterling on number one poultry. And James Sterling was not very keen on doing any drawings which might say the general public could understand. So Peter Palumbo asked us to produce booklets and so on uh, which would explain the building to a wider public. And that set up whole business for us initially uh, within Blueprint but then independently of delivering communications material for architects and for real estate 
uh, that would communicate architecture to let's say a wider public and so we worked on Broadgate on kind of place building by Foggo's, number one poultry, Heron Tower, Leadenhall building by Roger Sturk Harbour for British land. So over the very exciting period when the, the city was delivering world-class architecture and building up to being the world's centre of finance, these were exciting times. And then looking back at the early 2000s, it became quite a creative period for me in terms of delivering a very different way of communicating architecture. This is the Clerkenwell Architecture Biennale, which later became the London Festival of Architecture. This was the launch in 2004 when we grassed over the whole of St John Street to create Turner Street into a park. We brought longhorn cattle of the type who would have been brought down to market here in the 18th century. We drove them down the street to illustrate this connection between the shaping of the city and its history. And so in 2006, we drove a flock of sheep across the Millennium Bridge. This was a way of emulating the, the right of freemen of the City of London to drive sheep across London Bridge, but also here on Millennium Bridge to celebrate the impact that new infrastructure like the bridge has had on the economy and the regeneration of the south bank of the River Thames. One of the really important aspects of the whole festival was to get messages about architecture to a wider audience, literally put exhibitions in the street, like here at Paternosa Square, close to Temple Bar, where people could find out what was happening, uh, where architecture could be explained and architecture could be made real interest for the general public. And the London Festival of Architecture has grown over the years. It, it, it was every other year, it's now every year, and each year now involves nearly half a million people in the debate about architecture, creating a real involvement of the public in the debate about how we make better cities. Then in 2005, I started New London Architecture together with uh, Nick Mikio. We were looking to deliver a centre of architecture that could explain what was happening in London, that would be open to the public, to visitors to London, and also would be a centre of debate and discussion for uh, professionals. And uh, that has grown hugely over the last 15 years and is something that I'm very proud of having had and created. It is now a key part of the debate about architecture in London. The early 2000s of creative period, not just for me, but also for my wife. My wife commissioned Thomas Heatherwick to design the East Beach Cafe in Littlehampton using this uh, really striking uh, sculptural form uh, where Heatherwick wanted to produce an architecture which had a feeling of, let's say, driftwood, which had been uh, swept up onto the beach. And, and my wife also commissioned Asif Khan and Studio Weave to deliver installations in the town. And this has been a key part in the area's regeneration. I've been lucky enough to be invited to be a member of Boris Johnson's Mayor's Design Advisory Group and also to be one of Sadiq Khan's Mayor's Design Advocates. And so it's been great to have an opportunity to contribute to improving the quality of design across the city and get more closely involved in the debate. And at NLA, we've been closely involved in, in that debate and we've been producing a whole series of uh, research and documents which uh, we feel will contribute to how we deliver a more successful, a healthier, more sustainable and a more equitable city. So looking at great estates, tall buildings, public spaces, housing, how you accommodate a wide variety of work and also promoting London as an international design hub. So we've also looked at uh, polycentric cities, very important, I think, in the debate about the post-COVID environment. The London as a knowledge capital, very important in terms of driving London's economy into the future. And factory-made housing, very important in delivering more housing. In 2012, the Worship Company of Architects 
wanted to do something to celebrate the Olympics. And so we held a competition for an installation in Oldgate to mark the ancient gateway to the city going out towards Stratford in the east where the Olympics were taking place. And Studio Weave designed this wonderful installation which marked the, uh, the, the location of Oldgate, but also the fact that uh, Chaucer used to live in the accommodation above the, the gateway. And that idea of gateways to the city really brings me to my most recent project, and that is Temple Bar. I'm chairman of the Temple Bar Trust. And when I was master of the company, I wanted to try and push forward an idea which had been around at the founding of the company back in the early 80s, that the Temple Bar should become the home of the company of architects. We are now working to bring it back into civic use, to be used by the company, by visitors, to use as a place where we can have lectures, to talk about architecture more widely, to involve uh, visitors to the city, but also local schools. And particularly, we want to uh, promote diversity in the architectural profession, but also somewhere where we can communicate what we do to a wider public. And that has really been the theme of my career. It has been a most enjoyable career. And I hope, like most architects, I have done something to improve the quality of architecture, the quality of our cities and our environment, and the lives of the people who live in them. <laughs>